Now, the parents of 12-year-old Archie Battersby have lost an appeal against a decision to allow his life support treatment to end. Yes, the Court of Appeal ruled there were no grounds for them to challenge the decision that continuing Archie's treatment was, quote, futile. Archie's family will now take their fight to the European Court of Human Rights. Holly Dance, Archie's mum, spoke to Eamon and Rosie earlier today. No, we've still got, I believe we've still got one more option, which obviously, we've come this far, I'm not going to stop now. I demanded a private blood test. We haven't been given that. Um, and it was the examiners that actually asked the hospital, has this child, three times, has this child been given muscle relaxing drugs? They said Archie was brain dead after um, two days of being in hospital. Yeah. If that's the case, why is he still being heavily stated five weeks later? I mean, you are, you are convinced your boy will wake up. I know he will wake up. You know he will I wake know, up. I know, 100% he will wake up. But what happens if you don't get leave to appeal this again? He's or not, he's not going to get a chance to wake up. He's just going to be, he'll be killed, won't he? Killed is a... That, that's how I say it, he'll be killed. Description, yeah. Um, Along with the other children like Charlie Gard, Alfie Evans, it's not fair. Well, that's such a difficult uh, position for any family to be in, any mother, any parent. Uh, it'd be really hard to imagine what anyone would do in Archie's family's position. Um, and, in fact, if you thought you were, if you had a seven-year-old or a small child and you thought there was a sliver of a chance that you could change the outcome, what would you do? Would you be OK with the doctors and the courts saying the machine has to be switched off? Or, actually, would you be fighting to keep your child alive? And should parents have uh, more power over the end of life decisions. That's really the question we're asking today. Mm. Well, joining us to discuss this further is Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Romain, MBE. Thank you so much for joining us. It's, I mean, none of us here, I think, are professional medics. We don't understand the intricacies and nuances of neuroscience. But, I mean, what a very difficult decision for the parents and, and very difficult as well, I'd imagine, for people to look at this through the eyes of the law. Yes, and it's doubly tragic, isn't it? Firstly, the impending death of a child, but also the conflict between the two groups who normally work together uh, to save life, in other words, the parents uh, and the doctors. Um, and I noticed the mother just quoted Charlie Gard and Alfie Evans. Uh, they were about four or five years ago, and, and it just shows how rare this situation is. And normally, most parents and doctors will work together, feel they're on the same side. And so it's really painful when there is this conflict between them right now. And of course, you know, parents do not expect to bury their children. It can, it's against the natural order of things, and therefore it makes us feel even more sad. But I suppose the key question here is when to fight and when to let go. Uh, and I suppose, you know, and we can't talk about this case because we haven't seen the medical notes, um, but, you know, the parents have every right to insist on a, a full diagnosis, uh, every right to push uh, for all the proper treatments um, and the full knowledge of the options. But I would have thought there comes a point, in fact, I know there comes a point where you just have to say uh, the surgeons, the doctors, the medics, they actually are the experts. Um, and yes, parents can question, can challenge, uh, but if there's a unanimous medical opinion and it's then backed up by the courts, um, there comes a point where you have to say, this is awful, but I am going to let go. Uh, because otherwise you're not doing a, you're doing a disservice to the child. Now, whether that applies in this particular case, it's always hard to know. Uh, yeah. But there does come a point where you, where you do have to let go. And I suppose what's so hard for parents, and again, I'm not talking about this case, um, is how to separate your needs and the child's needs. There's a very thin dividing line between saying, I don't want my child to die and I don't want me to lose my child. How much is it about you and your sense of loss and how much is it the best interests of the child? And if, if uh, the child is already brain dead, which may or may not be the case in this particular situation, then there comes a point where however tragic, however painful, you just have to accept the child has died because actually it is only surviving anyway on artificial support. Yeah, I, I, I do wonder, um, I know you've been a, a sort of campaigner of choice in, in matters of, of difficult dying, so to speak, and you've set up uh, the Interfaith Leaders for Dignity in Dying group, which uh, campaigns for terminally ill people to have the choice of letting themselves die. I wonder what the distinct, how you navigate the, the complexity of the fact this child obviously can't make their own decision. So surely it's the parents' decision whether they should 
let the, their own child die or not. Why is it right for that choice to be taken away from them? And I completely understand what you're saying about, you know, the doctors have, all, all the doctors have said unanimously that it's the right decision. But surely, surely the parent has the ultimate decision over the life and death of their child. Yes, and by the way, this is very different from the Dignity in Dying yeah. campaign, which only deals with, with adults who are, um, and, and who, are, uh, who have ability to make their own minds up. Uh, and it certainly never advocates assisted dying uh, for those who cannot um, do so of their own free will. So this is very, very different. Um, well, you're right. That, you know, in this case, the child can't, you know, not because it's a child, but because he lacks consciousness, can't make up its own mind. And therefore, he uh, or she depends on external people. First cause of course the first point of call is to the parents but you know there comes a point where the parents and their knowledge or rather what the parents have is a wish for the child to survive they don't have the knowledge or the expertise to decide whether the child is able to do so um whereas uh, there comes a point you know where you have to rely on experts um, whether it's navigating through a sea channel or mending a car, you know, there are people who do know more than the parents. The parents may love the child, but the, 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 the clinicians are the ones who can actually say, this child has already died, it's already brain dead. Uh, and therefore, there comes a point where the, the parents' desire to keep going for the child as long as possible has to give way to the weight of medical evidence. Now, if there's divided evidence, okay, then the parents can fight. But if it's unanimous uh, medical evidence, then why are the parents holding out other than for just not wanting to let go, which is totally understandable, and I don't blame the parents at all. But if, if it was my child, and it, all the doctors were saying, look, the child has actually already died, it's incapable of surviving uh, without life support machine, then incredibly reluctantly, um, I would say, well, you're the experts and I'm not. And by the way, I've been in that situation, not with my own child, but sat with a congregant whose child had died, was being kept alive, and I was with them literally as they held the child in the hand. The medics turned off the machine and they gently said goodbye. And it was the right decision. And by the way, it also meant um, that they didn't have this anger, uh, which obviously then can impede the grieving process. Because what happens when, if and when Archie does pass away, um, are the parents going to be able to actually return to the stream of life? Or are they constantly going to be fighting this battle and constantly reliving it? So I, I feel incredibly sorry for them. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot for them to deal with. And I'm, I, in the wake of all of this, it will be very hard knowing how much time and energy they put in. Dr. Jonathan Romain, thank you ever so much for joining us to discuss this really delicate issue. Uh, yes, uh, get your views uh, in on anything we've been speaking about today and what you make of that moral dilemma about who should have the final say, gbviews at gbnews.uk.